recently. I'm giving you the opportunity now while we're waiting to come back here. Anyone? Anybody want to share what your New Year's resolutions are? No, never mind. That's between, that's between you and the Lord. But... You know, sometimes that's enough, man, right? I, uh, I've already defied uh, living longer than I figured I would have, especially back in my days, boy. I tell you, there's so many times I should have been dead or, or in jail or something, but uh, praise God. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, this, is our, this is my last message of the year. In fact, most of you, I won't even see you until next year, you know? Um, but it is uh, the New Year's Eve message here. I hope that you are blessed today. I really hope it's practical for you. Let's dive in our usual way. Repeat after me what's on the screen. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. Indeed, what I'm about to preach is not just for pastors and and ministers and leaders. It's for you. Um, Has anybody been blessed by the last three weeks, uh, the messages which were basically takeaways from the Christmas story. Anybody been blessed? I hope so. Um, Last week, we had a different takeaway each week, and we read Luke 2, the the Christmas story, and each each week was a takeaway. Last week's takeaway was that when God makes a promise, he delivers. Amen? He doesn't just say, I'm going to do it, and then change his mind, and I'm so glad for that. So with all of that, now on New Year's Eve, I want to kind of bring... Bring it all together and bring you, I hope, a message of hope and maybe even some clarity. I hope that today somebody gets clarity on some things in your life. Um, That'd be a good thing for church to offer. Amen? Clarity? You know, you come to church for some answers. You come to church for some hope. Um, And I sure hope that you will receive that today. I want to preach about something that I don't really preach. I don't think I've preached a whole lot about it. It's not like I've been avoiding it. It just hasn't really been has really come up until now, and I want to talk to you today about timing, specifically God's timing, okay? God's timing. And so with that, I want to start right out of the chute. I just want to say that every attribute, every attribute of God is intentional, including his timing, okay? Including his timing. I mean, everything that God does is intentional anyway. Everything that he says is intentional but also his timing is intentional. How many know there's God's timing and there's our timing? <laughs> How many know that they don't usually meet? <laughs> they're, they're, they're almost never the same, right? In fact, I'd say that many of our struggles are because we, we, we think that God thinks the same way that we do. In fact, I'll, I'll just make it a, 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 put it up on the screen and make it official. <laughs> our struggles in faith are often based on our lack of understanding about God's timing. How how does that grab you? Uh, I mean, I think you can probably kind of already fill in the blanks a little bit of where I'm going with that. We struggle in our faith when we assume, first of all, that God's timing is our timing. And when he doesn't act the way that we would like him to act or even think that he's going to act, then we automatically start struggling in our faith, don't we? Maybe I didn't hear it right from God. Anybody ever heard that or struggled with that one? Maybe I just didn't hear from the Lord. Or maybe he changed his mind. Maybe I missed it. Boy, I tell you what, I I struggled with that one early in my faith uh, quite a bit. Maybe I missed God on this one, right? Anybody ever wonder about that? Maybe I missed God. I don't know. I want to tell you, somebody here today, that God is not elusive. (laughs) He's not, he doesn't give you like this massive, thing that you have to figure out, you know, like a problem-solving thing, and, and to be able to find out what his will is. He wants to reveal his will, but he also wants us to understand that his timing is not our timing, and understand that those words that Jesus said, that my Father is always at work even to this very moment, are true for us and our situations. Amen. So timing, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Did you know that the Bible has a lot to say about timing? The very first psalm Right out of the chute, the very first psalm, Psalm 1, 
starts out with this in verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person, get this, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prosper. So let's say those, those highlighted words together that I have here on the screen. What are, those, what are those two words? In season. Notice it says the person who, who trusts in God, meditates on his word. What, what is, let's get practical here. I want it today to be practical. You know, there's, there's this idea of delighting in, in, in the Lord and, and meditating on his word. But what does that mean in a practical sense? What does meditating on God's word mean to you? Anybody? Just no wrong answers here. Thinking about his word, okay, pondering it. Chewing on it, yeah. Being in the present, being in his presence, sure. Okay, those are all good answers. And it says that person that does this will be like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. In season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Boy, sign me up for that. See, that, that, that idea of in season, that means at the right time, at the God-appointed time. That's what we're talking about today is God's timing. Here's another in Habakkuk 2, 3. For the revelation awaits, let's say these words here, an appointed time. It speaks to, of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. So that's surely about timing. It's about an appointed time. So God has an appointed time. What does that mean? That means that he has already set the time for your breakthrough, for your answer, for your healing, for, your, for your, uh, whatever it is you're praying for, for the reconciliation of your family, whatever it is. There is an appointed time for that. That means that God's already set it. He's already gone ahead of you and set it while he comes back and takes you on this journey of you reaching that, um, that answer to your prayer, that breakthrough that you so much desire. But it's God's timing. One of my favorites, though, is in Galatians and, uh, 6 and 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the, let's say those two words together, proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Man, I... I that's a good one to memorize. That was one of the first scriptures I memorized years and years and years ago. And um, I just want to share a little bit of personal thing about that. I was really struggling with something, really struggling. I was going through a lot personally, and I was, ha- I was facing a lot of disappointment, a lot of hurt in my life, a lot of upheaval in my life. And I had literally asked the Lord, God, am I wasting my time here? Am I, should I just give up on this? I don't see any fruition here. I don't see any results from this prayer. I don't, I don't see what you're doing in this whole thing, Lord. I don't, I don't understand. Am I wasting my time? Should, is it time for me to just move on? And we were praying here at church, and we, we had a group of us had joined hands, and we were praying. After we finished that prayer, a, a lady came up to me and said, hey, I don't know if this is going to mean anything to you. But uh, I really believe while we were praying that scripture, Galatians 6, 9, came to mind for you. Go, go look it up and see what you think. And I did. I went and looked it up. I couldn't believe it because God answered, literally answered my prayer. Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. See, that's his time, right? We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, that tells me that I have the ability to thwart God's moving my life by giving up, right? See, we're waiting for God's time. There's a temptation to give up. There's a temptation to stop praying. There's a temptation to stop trusting. But waiting on God's timing means we're going to consistently stay in there and believe and trust in him, amen? So, it, it, I mean, I could talk about that for a while, about what that means to give up. But I want to keep on because I'm talking about God's timing here. And, but perhaps... The most succinct example in the Bible I can show you about God's timing is in, indeed, Ecclesiastes 3.11, the scripture that Dee opened up with today. 
It says, he has made everything beautiful. Let's say these three words again. In his time. Let's say it again right there, those highlighted words. In his time, or in its time in this case. He has also set eternity in the human heart. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So in its time, in his time, in God's time, we got to get that. It's his timing and not us and not ours. And by the way, along with that, I would also say that it's his way and not our way. (laughs) Right? In fact, God says it this way in Isaiah 55. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we got to get out of our own heads. We got to get... How many know that we need to get out of our own way at times? <laughs> Man, you know, sometimes the biggest bully that we have in our lives is the one staring right back at us in the mirror. And the, the biggest struggle that we have is fighting that internal battle. Our, our, our faith muscles want to flex and we want to grow in our faith, but at the same time, we have these accusations coming from, of all places, inside our own hearts, right? Right? I just give up. You know this isn't going to work for you. You've tried this. It's a failure. Um, how many have struggled with feeling like a failure at times? And, and that's why it's important for us to understand that. I believe that's why it says in the Bible, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, I, I, I would throw at you that it's impossible for you to be a failure if you're in Christ. You literally cannot possibly be a failure. It's not even literally possible. Now, you can fail, right? How many know you can fail? How many know you can make mistakes? <laughs> and we do make mistakes. But see, if we over-spiritualize those, and we make way too much out of it in our minds, anybody ever over-spiritualize, not us, right? Man, sometimes we over-spiritualize everything. We look for God in everything. Like, well, uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. I, just went to the, I went to the store, and they didn't have uh, the bread that I wanted. So I don't know. I think that's a sign from the Lord. No, okay, chill out. <laughs> chill out on that stuff. You know, well, God told me this, God told me that, you know, like, just kind of just, you know, the Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. You know, things happen. We don't have to always look for the spiritual implication of just everything in life. But we surely don't want to do that when we fail. When we fail at something, when we make a mistake, guess what it is? It's a mistake. It's a failure. It's, It's what you did. It's not who you are. Amen. It's what you did. It's not who you are. And you can learn when you can give yourself some grace and laugh about it and go, wow, that's a thought. I just figured out how not to do that. (laughs) But instead, we oftentimes bash ourselves and we feel like a failure because we failed. And, um, but see, it's, it's all about God's timing. And he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. And so that tells me that I need to learn a discipline of getting out of my own head. Getting out of my own head when things are happening in my life. Getting out of my own head when I'm worrying about my future. Getting out of my head when I'm even facing an immediate crisis such as a financial stress or something like that. Getting out of my head because God's ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. That means I need to somehow or another figure out how to project where I am into where he is, right? Right? He is in a different place. He's not worrying, right? He's not giving in to fear like I am. By the way, can I just say this off to the side? Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and what did he say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you pray, you pray God's, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come in this situation. I'm facing a financial crisis. Or I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, Lord. Your kingdom come in that. That means, you know what? I don't believe in heaven anybody's wringing their hands about financial worries, right? So bring that peace and that joy and that contentment, Lord, down in my situation. But see, I have to get out of my head in order to do that. I have to realize that God's thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are not my ways. He even says, "As as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, he's not down here in this little sphere that I live in. He's up here. Man, if I had time, I would talk to you about how the, uh, the Beatitudes, when Jesus 
was giving the Beatitudes in, in the book of Matthew, he said those words, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, you know, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They shall be filled, right? That's one of them. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Okay, that word blessed means, it doesn't mean happy. It doesn't mean frolicking in the meadow on white linens. That means you're, that, there's a word in the Greek, it's called makarios. It means to rise above. And it's a word used for the rich and the affluent because back in those days, the rich people had roofs top, rooftops. They had fancy houses. They had rooftops. And, and the, the culture that Jesus was talking to, they knew very well about this. If you were rich and affluent, you were often up on top of your roof above the common man looking down on them. And you were above life's problems. And that's what Jesus was saying. You're going to be above them. I mean, you'll be, still be affected by it. You'll still have worries. You'll still have things you'll have to deal with. But you're going to be above it in terms of it, it, it can't get you. It can't take you down. It's not going to take you out. It might touch you, but it's not going to ruin you. Amen? And that's the same idea. God's saying, hey, I'm up here. My thoughts are higher than yours. I have thoughts that, are, that you can't possibly understand. And part of those thoughts and part of those ways, of course, are about his timing. So let's take a look at that scripture in, in Ecclesiastes 3 a little bit more. And in fact, I want to show you the amplified Bible version of it. It says, he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in every human or in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done, his overall plan from the beginning to the end. So first of all, when I look at this, when I, when, I, when I go to unpack this, first thing I notice is that God's timing is appropriate. Did you get that? It said he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. God's way is always right. God's answer is always correct, and his timing is always appropriate. So oftentimes you'll hear me say the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing, right? We try to rush it. We want it now. Um, but when we do it God's way, it's always appropriate. So it, it strikes me that I've talked earlier about how the Bible is intentional. So just the very fact that God needs to tell me this through his word tells me that perhaps I might struggle at times with thinking that my time is appropriate and not his time. God, I want it. Where is it? You know, we're that kind of a fast food society now anyway, right? You go to our restaurant. I'll take a burger. How would you like it? Right now, right? See, but when, you're, when we're really honest, our timing, when you think about our timing, our timing is often laced with things, right? It's laced with our own preferences. It's laced with our own agendas, our own comforts. Uh, limited vision, for sure. What does that mean, limited vision? That means we can't see what's around the corner, but you know what? He can, because his ways are not my ways, and his thoughts are not my thoughts. So when God says, wait for my timing, you know, there's something to that. You know, there's something to, if I had time, I'd take you over to Isaiah 40, where it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. And that word wait in Hebrew can be translated also to mean hope. Those that hope in the Lord. Those that wait in the Lord. Waiting on his timing. See, it doesn't mean that we're going to sit around and just cross our fingers and hope like we're hoping like a kid gets, hope, like a kid hopes that he's going to get a bicycle for Christmas. No, we're hoping and waiting in expectation on God's timing and his provision. Amen. So yes, God's timing is always appropriate, but what I just read in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it also said that God planted an, internal, an eternal sense of purpose in each of us. I'll just read it to you. I'm not going to show it on the screen. It said, he also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. So God planted an eternal sense of purpose in each one of us. That tells me that, guys, we are not arbitrary. We are not just here taking up space. 
man, sometimes we need to get, we need to have that reminded, or have, be reminded of that. Because sometimes we do feel like we're just taking up space. Sometimes we do just feel like we're more of an annoyance and an inconvenience and just kind of off to the side. Anybody ever feel like you just came with a package? Anybody here ever feel like you're playing a supporting role in the production of somebody else's life? Well, I don't even have time to unpack that one. But I, you know, I mean, maybe, they, maybe about half an hour from now, you're going to get that, what I just said. But the fact that God would literally leave the 99 and go search for you <laughs> sometimes doesn't register. Maybe we hear it up here in our, in our minds and we hear it with our ears, but traveling down to our heart and now to our feet where we walk it out is another thing. But this says that God planted an inter- eternal sense of purpose in each of us. That means that he purposely made us with identity, destiny, and purpose. So, look, there's a statement I'm going to make here, and I'm not going to back off from it. It is not our job to figure out our identity, destiny, and purpose. (laughs) Now, that smacks right in the face of the culture that we live in right now, doesn't it? You know? I mean, that, that, that would not preach very well out in the street. In fact, that's quite the opposite of what's being even taught in schools. But God made us. He's the one that put this eternal perspective in us. He's the one that gave us our identity. It's not our job. We couldn't figure these things out if we wanted to, right? By the way, check this out. I don't know if you know this is in the Word. Isaiah 29, 16 says, You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? You did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? (laughs) By the way, that's not your printed notes that I handed out. I don't know how that got slipped through there, but I apologize for that. But if you're looking at the electronic version, it's, it's in there. But get that. You turn things upside down as if the potter, that means the one that the creator, the one that's making, you know, God himself, We're thought to be like the clay. That's what we're doing today in this culture that we live in. We we tell God who we are. We tell God what we think, and and we we want God to kind of come along with our plan. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Well, good question. Let's ponder that. Set that off to the side as we continue, because notice the next thing in Ecclesiastes 11 is this notion. It says, we all have a mysterious longing that only God can satisfy. We all means we all. That means even the people that don't acknowledge him, even you know, atheists, right, who literally don't believe there's a God, guess what? God planted in them a mysterious longing that only God can satisfy. Well, we sure try other ways, though, don't we? Man, I mean, these days we got, you know, we have so much technology. We got information that's just immediate, you know. You can, all this, you know, we've just gotten kind of fat, happy, and dumb as a society. And now we got AI coming in, you know. Don't get me going on that. You create a machine that's smarter than you are, man. Watch out. <laughs> Trouble coming. But, see, that's the thing is that we're, we've gotten to the point where we don't really believe that we need this unseen God, this idea of a creator, seems a little bit old-fashioned, to, to a culture that is kind of full of itself. We look at ourselves and the technology that we have, and so we look for it, and we have the, but each one of us has this longing, and we just handle it, and we go, and we try to satisfy it in different ways. Sometimes it's through information. We just want to be smarter and smarter and smarter, right? Sometimes it's through the... Uh, accumulation of things, you know, materialism. I, I, gotta, I just got to get more. I want to acquire more. Sometimes we just want to keep people happy. Maybe you feed off of people's approval. You're trying to satisfy a longing that's mysterious and you cannot identify it. So all of our addictions, by the way, are misapplied longings that we're trying to satisfy in other ways. <laughs> Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> Coming up on 26 years clean, is that right? Did I get the math right? Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you honestly. I mean, it wasn't like I was just, if you saw the way I used to drink, man, you think, man, that guy's really thirsty. He, he has some kind of problem, man. He got to drink a lot, you know? He's dehydrated. 
No, no, I was trying. There was a mysterious longing in me, a longing for peace, a longing for some kind of contentment, a longing to just feel like I'm okay. And when you have all of the stuff that you don't want to deal with, you just, you all, and it's come sta- it all gets kind of stacked up and your past is there knocking on the door and your accusations that you live with on a daily basis come to a point, you got you to act out some way, <laughs> right? And that's why they call it acting out, by the way, because you're acting out what you've already been acting in. Jesus said, from out of, the, out, of the, out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart flows. The Oki version is uh, whatever is deep in the well comes out in the bucket. And that's how it works. It's a mysterious longing that only God can satisfy. And that's why we chase this. We chase that. That's why we have things called midlife crisis. <laughs> None of us ever struggle with that, though, right? You know, we got to go out and just do the stuff. You know, we got to be popular. We got to have some things altered, you know, and we got to, we were trying to desperately to hold on to youth because it's youth for whatever reason. By the way, isn't it unfortunate that old age is a side effect of wisdom? <laughs> it just, that's a bummer, man. <laughs> Why can't we just be born wise when we're young and we can actually do something about it? <laughs> Doesn't work that way, though, right? But yeah, when, you know, when we're young, you know, the older generation is, they've been there and done that, and they know, and they have pictures, by the way. And, um, and they're trying to tell the young generation, and the young generation is like, yeah, oh, man, yeah, whatever, you're irrelevant, you know. That's not going to happen to me. Then guess what? It does happen to them. And then they're pretty soon, they're the, next, they're the old generation, and they're now trying to talk to the new generation, right? It's the same old thing. Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> really? This, by the way, this world that we're living in right now, it's the 60s all over again. <laughs> Chill out, man. We made it through the 60s. <laughs> anyway. I digress. We all have this mysterious longing in us that only God can satisfy. And then it said in what I read, here it's highlighted, yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done, his overall plan from the beginning to the end. In other words, we all have this identity in us crying out to be fulfilled, a longing that we can't even understand. We will search here, we will search there, especially Get this, especially if we're stubborn and refuse to acknowledge God, like the culture that we live today, live in today, we're going to keep on searching. We're going to come up with our own ideas of what we were meant for. And yet, get this next statement, we will always come up short and frustrated until we acknowledge our maker. That's what that means. That's what that means. And sometimes... Waiting on God's timing means that God's given us time for us to get our attitudes correct, (laughs) right? I mean, I've been there and I've done that where I start out with a need and I just think I got to have this. God, I don't understand why you're not moving in this situation. He doesn't move right away. And I go through this process of realizing that my hands are, are holding onto this thing for dear life, as if I got to have this, I need it, Lord, to survive, as it were. And then he slowly takes me through this process where he's prying my fingers off. Because did you know that God won't touch anything that your hands are all over? And so, yes, it's his timing. And part of his timing is just to get my attitude correct, that it's, it's all about him. And so oftentimes I'll come up short and frustrated until we acknowledge our maker These things that we search for, they will never work and they will never answer the deep questions that we have in our hearts. Young people, I just implore you, don't wait until you get old and and have a midlife crisis or or you're even worse on your deathbed and you realize that all the things that you thought that were uh, important are now silly. Tell you what, there's few things more. In fact, the the thing that's worse than death is is a life not lived. And you're not fully living unless you're living in your destiny that God created for you. Oh, you can exist. You can survive. I want to thrive. How about you? I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. 
And we thrive when we admit and we acknowledge, God, you are my maker. You know better than I do as to what's going on and all of the stuff that I've been feeling and sensing in my life, Lord, am I, and up to this point, even these things that I, that I just want to uh, bury myself in, Lord, God, these things that feel safe to me. Question, what feels safe to you? What is your, what's your safe place? What's your safe place? I mean, that's a personal question. You need to answer that on your own. It might not be the things that you think are, are, you know, about. Maybe it isn't just having everybody happy at you, happy with you. Maybe, maybe your safe place is isolation. Hello. I mean, isolation, that's a very interesting thing, man. Isolation, what in the world is the appeal of isolation? Isolation, the appeal is that it's safe, <laughs> Right? It's safe because people can't hurt you there. People aren't going to disappoint you there. People aren't hypocrites there. All that, right? But the problem is, is that the very reason that you're frustrated with people is because you were created for community. That's how God made us. And yet you go into isolation to prevent yourself from being hurt again, and you're starving yourself from the very thing that you need. (laughs) It's self-sabotage at best. So... Isolation, sometimes it goes even further than that. Sometimes we revel in the dark. Sometimes we actually get alone and we kind of thrive. We kind of have think this, you know, this dark side of us is, is actually kind of cool and all of that. Well, you know what? There's a shelf life to all of this. <laughs> Amen? How many of you know there's a shelf life to these things that we turn to? Man, our whole lives show that. In other words, there's going to be a re- day of reckoning where it will just not work any longer. Because it was never meant to. These things will never work, but we keep trying. We're often stubborn. We blame others for our problems. It's our parents. It's, our, it's society. It's the establishment. And, you know, that was what the 60s said. You know, where you, you were the... Anybody over 30 couldn't be trusted in the 60s, by the way. That was, that was the thing, you know. You're the man, you know. You're the establishment. Irony is, is that all those people that were part of that are now in their 70s. You know, <laughs> how, how's that working now? You know, <laughs> I was thinking of that, that there's a song, I'm Young, I'm Wild, and I'm Free. Uh, you guys know, some of you guys know who that was. Those guys that sang that song are now in their 60s, you know. <laughs> See, youth is fleeting. These things that we think are cool are fleeting. What is cool now will not be cool maybe even in a week from now, right? Look at how how everything changes. Look at how, you know, the cancel culture is now just feeding on itself. You ever notice that in the society? That's not sustainable. Everybody's offended. You know, that's what we do. We want to blame everybody else. We We want to get angry because these things in our lives aren't working, and so it's easier to blame others. Or we call names. That's what we call, that's what we do now in society. We just name call. If you don't agree with me, I'll just call you some kind of phobe, right? Isn't that what's, what's going on in our society? Rather than having an intelligent discourse, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to call you names. I'm going to revert back to grade school and just say, well, you're just this or you're just that, you know? Rather than realize what the real source of my inner turmoil is, Right? Why in the world would I drink? Why in the world would I feel like I need to cheat on my, my wife or my husband or feel like I got to have somebody always happy with me? Because it's an internal thing. There's a mysterious longing in me that only God can satisfy. Okay, what am I getting at? What does this mean for us today? I want to pick it up because I'm going a little bit longer than I thought I would. Church, I believe... I'm going to turn the corner here, and I'm on the backside. I believe that there are some here today who have tried hard to find your way and are still experiencing frustration, anxiety, and perhaps even anger in your life's circumstances. Where is God in all this? Why hasn't he moved yet, right? Perhaps you've tried praying and believing, and yet you see your past as unredeemable. You see your obstacles as unmovable, and you see your dreams as unreachable. But I can hear the Spirit say to us today, I have never quit on you. 
Don't you quit on yourself. Well, I don't know, God. It sure feels like you quit on me. Okay, well, see, you're, you're assuming that his ways are your ways. <laughs> you're assuming that his timing is your timing. He never quit on you. Well, I don't know, Lord. I've been praying for healing, and I've been praying for that breakthrough. I've been praying for my family, and I've been praying for uh, even more than that. And all I've experienced is opposition, disappointment, setbacks. Frankly, Lord, it's, it's discouraging, and it makes me want to quit and give up. Okay, see, that's the problem. When we give in to doubt and we want to quit, it is because we are looking at our circumstances, trying to figure it out, and our faith is based on our own vision and timetable. You get what I'm saying? You're seeing things through your own eyes. You're seeing things through your own timetable. In other words, we don't see the results. We think too much time has passed and too many irreversible things have happened. Perhaps God's not even going to answer and you are forgetting the basic point here that God makes all things beautiful in his time. In his time. Let's say those words in yellow. In his time. He's not bound by time like we are. So let's say this nice and loud together. Time doesn't hold God. He holds it. You get that? He's not under the, he's not under the clock like we are. In fact, Psalm 90 says it this way. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the, morning, uh, the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. See, that's God. That's not us. Guys, what am I saying in all? I'm, I'm saying, and in fact, we talked about this this morning in our men's get-together. God has been calling us to get in position, amen? <laughs> in fact, last week I said, I made this statement. I said, God isn't preparing your miracle for you. He's preparing you for your miracle. And I believe he wants to do amazing things in this church. He wants to do amazing things in your life, but he is waiting for us to get in that position. Okay, so what is that position? I believe it's time to stand in belief and obedience. Belief and obedience. Trusting in him. Understanding that his ways are not our ways. Believing that he is still at work when we don't see it. Believing that we will see it in his time. God is at work and when the timing is right, he will move you and place you in the right place at the right time and arrange the circumstances for your breakthrough. This is a word of hope right here. I wish I would have heard a message like this when I was young because, man, I flapped around a lot. You know what I'm talking about, flapping around? Try this, try that, worry, do this, all, you know, freaking out about this, freaking out about that. He's trying to get us in position. I'll tell you another thing, too. He's not bound by time. He's not bound by, uh, check this next statement out, circumstances. He's not bound by time or circumstances. We, we look at circumstances, don't we? And we make assumptions. We make decisions even. We act on those decisions, and thus our lives are a mess at times. And with all this, now, I want to now, I want to take the time that I have, which is not much. I want to take a look at a familiar verse that I quote from a lot. And I want to show you about how it has to do with God's timing. And I'll take just a few minutes to do this. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You've heard me quote from this many times. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, bring your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So what does this have to do with God's timing? Well, I'll show you. Because in this section of Scripture, we have basically two timelines. We got the present. That's where we live. That's where we struggle. That's where we live and breathe. 
We have a problem that's causing us anxiety. We need relief now, right? That's the present. So we bring those requests to God now. But this is saying, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but this is saying, bring your request to God now in the present and experience peace now. Great peace. It says peace that transcends all understanding. And we do this, you experience that peace, get this, before you even get the answer. Have you ever noticed that? We got two timelines going on in this section of scripture here. We, do we live in the present? We struggle in the present. We have worries in the present. Will we bring that in the present to God? We give it to him, and this peace comes now, and we haven't even gotten the answer yet. Because that's the second timeline. There's two timelines in this. The second is the future when God does answer. But look at that. I mean, we're no longer requiring that answer to have peace because we got peace now. <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? You're trusting in God's timing. And I tell you what, trusting in God's timing has you in position for an awesome breakthrough. You get what I'm saying? He takes note of that. He takes note of that because he also takes note of the other. The opposite is when we're freaking out, taking matters into our own hands, flopping around. I got to do this, got to do that. I must have missed him. I better do this. Uh, you know. Well, he loves us, but he's patient with us, but I think he lets us go ahead and flap around for a while, doesn't he? <laughs> kind of like that wind-up monkey with the symbols, you know, ching, 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 you know. And then pretty soon, you know, you got to, you wind down and you run out of juice, you know, like the Energizer rabbit. Sooner or later, God's there to pick up the pieces. But ideally, this scripture is saying, hey, the way it's supposed to be is that you live in the present, you have concerns in the present, you bring those requests to the Lord, trusting in his timing that he has heard you and that he will indeed make all things beautiful in his time. And then you have peace that transcends understanding right now. So check this next statement out. This, this just summarizes it. It says, when we trust in God's timing, we have peace today for tomorrow's answer. Amen? When we trust in God's timing, we have peace today for tomorrow's answer. Now, that's a great thing to hear and, and know as we wrap up a, a year, right? And we're getting ready to start a new year. How about if that was our resolution? God, I'm going to trust you, but I'm going to see some amazing things, God, this year. I want to see some powerful things. I want to see signs and wonders in my life. I want to see miracles. I want to see healings, Lord. I want to see uh, relationships mended. I want to see that breakthrough that I've been asking for, Lord, God. And so right now, while I see no evidence of any of that happening in my life, I'm going to trust that with you. I'm going to trust your timing, and I'm going to experience that peace right now. And it hasn't even happened yet. We don't have to have the answer or the provision now. In fact, by the way, did you notice that this verse does not even address the provision or the answer? Did, have you ever noticed that before? It would be nice if it was written this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And he will immediately provide your answer so that you can relax and have peace. That's my version. I love that, right? Doesn't say that, though, does it? <laughs> It'd be nice if it was that way. So I see a few things when I look at this in the whole context of what we said today. And I'll close with this. Four points. We will have problems that cause anxiety. Amen. Would you agree with that? We are commanded to not give in to anxiety, but instead bring our requests to God. And get this. As we trust God, we will experience peace that we cannot explain. <laughs> That's what that means, peace, you know, that goes beyond understanding, that transcends all understanding, what Philippians says. Peace of God that transcends, that means it rises above your understanding. Like, in other words, what does that mean? That means 
man, all this is going on, and I'm not freaking out. I don't understand it. I feel like I'm behind on my worrying, man. I better get busy. I told somebody not too long ago there was something going on in my life, and I said, you know what's weird is that I'm not worried about it, and it kind of worries me that I'm not worried. Because <laughs> it's new uncharted territory, you know? <laughs> and it's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? That's the way it is. When your people then, see, here's the thing. Then now you can, your kids are watching, your neighbors are watching, your friends are watching, and they can come to you and go, wow, you know what? You were going through that, and I've been, I've been noticing you, man. You're, you're not freaking out like you should be. What's your secret? <laughs> and you tell them what your secret is, right? That's the way it works. As we trust God, we experience peace that we can understand. And lastly, part of this peace is knowing God has heard our prayer and will answer in his timing. Amen? I believe God hears every single one of our prayers. I do. And I believe that his answers are rarely in our timing. And they're often different than what we think. But they're always appropriate. <laughs> Amen? Bless you. I hope you received from something from that today. Sorry I went a little, little over, but um, I wanted to make it practical for you today. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you, God, for your encouragement today, Lord. I just want your word to speak to me right where I live, Lord. Translate that word to the language of my heart. Reach me where I am, Lord, and I pray the same for each person here today and those watching from home on the recording, Lord. And as we go into this new year, Father, I pray, God, that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be just talk, not these resolutions, Lord, that usually falter by about February, but, God, real commitment to trust you, to trust you this year, God, to stand in belief and obedience, God, and to be in position for that blessing that you want to bring in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>